Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. We have an absolutely jam-packed event in store uh, for everyone today. Uh, I'm looking in the chat now here on YouTube, and I can see we've got classrooms and individuals joining us from all over the world, from Australia, from Canada, uh, from Wales in the UK, from Barcelona, Ireland, uh, Scotland. It is going to be a really exciting event. If you've been following along, you know that the Oosterschelde is a busy ship. So right now it's in Cape Verde uh, after having sailed there from our first stop in Tenerife. So the sailing there was absolutely incredible. I have a video clip here that I want to share of the Oosterschelde sailing at sunset. Huge shout out to Rodri and Tom for getting that incredible footage with the drone. Um, very, very brave guys. I'd be very nervous flying my drone with a moving ship and wind. Uh, so absolutely incredible that they're able to get us those amazing images of the ship. Uh, if you are following along on the website, we have a beautiful map, an interactive map where you can follow along. We can upload pictures and video in real time. So if we take a look at this little map here, you can see that the ship has been making its way along the coast of France and Spain before reaching Tenerife uh, in the Canary Islands where the first Darwin leaders came on board. And then that beautiful sunset making its way towards Cape Verde. And that in fact is where uh, the ship is right now. You can see this little video clip here uh, of some shearwaters, little birds, little seabirds flying in front of the ship, leading it uh, to the islands of Cape Verde. So very cool. Follow the interactive map. There's lots of great things going on uh, with that live interactive map. So we have a new group of Darwin leaders on board and they're working on an absolutely incredible array of projects with Biosphera, an incredible conservation organization. And we're going to meet Alberto uh, from the organization a little bit later on in the event and talk a little bit about the sea turtle project that they have going on. But right now there's projects on sharks and rays, there's two turtle per sea turtle projects, endemic plants, seabirds, looking for a reptile that was previously thought to be extinct, uh, and marine plastics. So the Darwin leaders are keeping very, very busy this week, uh, and we'll get a chance to see some of those project videos during next week's World's Most Exciting Classroom event. So let's dive right into it. I see more people saying hi in the chat. That's great. Keep those coming. We're going to have a few times we'll have some Q&A during the event as well. But now we're going to talk a little bit about the octopus. So when Darwin visited Cape Verde, he was so excited by the octopus. He was scrambling around in the tide pools and just fell in love with the octopus that he saw there. Um, they were very interactive. They'd shoot ink. They'd spray jets of water at him. He was amazed by the way they could change colors uh, and change their shape to move through different size spaces. And in fact, he did take one of them on board the ship uh, in a bucket. He kept it alive for a few days and then uh, eventually was preserved as one of the first uh, specimens that he took. So this week I was able to connect with the Natural History Museum uh, in London and we were able to have a little special treat. So I'm going to share that little video with you now. We're going to meet John, the curator of mollusks at the Natural History Museum. The first little part of the video, uh, his camera wasn't cooperating. But after about 30 seconds, everything kind of goes to normal. So let's take a look uh, at this video together right now. Uh, my name is John Ablett. I'm the senior curator in charge of mollusks at the Natural History Museum in London. And I always tell people that my job is basically to look after the mollusk collections stored here. So I look after, me and my team, we look after about 8 million specimens. And these are mollusk specimens collected over the last... 200 plus years, uh, right up until you know the last few days, uh, and we store them 
where we add new specimens and we make them available to scientists and the general public in order to uh, learn more about the natural world. I mean, every day, pretty much, we have visitors from around the world, generally scientists or students who come to study a certain aspect, maybe a specific taxonomic family or the fauna of a country or a region. So they come here and I help guide them, uh, help them to use the collections, sort of uh, decode some of the, the labels, the old handwriting that goes with them, and tr really trying to make sure that they get the most out of our collection. They can really use them to solve whatever problem they're trying to. So not everyone is able to visit us here in London, so often get uh, emails, phone calls, letters, the odd facts, uh, where people ask me to help them with their scientific queries or ask me to look in the collection to find data that might enhance their studies. And that's really what we are. We're kind of um, the intermediaries, almost like the librarian, as if our, our collection was a book. Librarians are a, a kind of a nice term, uh, sort of in parallel to curators. Of, of allowing people to access the collections and helping them decode some of the mysteries so they can really learn more about the natural world. And of course, as, as well as helping other scientists, uh, there's the upkeep of the collection. So making sure the specimens are in good order, they don't degrade, um, transferring the data onto electronic databases so people can access this remotely. We also help with things like exhibitions, uh, teaching, um, sometimes people from the press or from film companies uh, want some advice to make sure they've got their facts right. Uh, and then with any time we've got left, uh, we all have our private research. So personally, I'm really interested in snails most of the time. And I'm really interested in the biodiversity in Southeast Asia and South America as well. Two really undiscovered areas of potential biodiversity. Okay, so here you can see Darwin's octopus, uh, hopefully a little clearer. Um, as I said, really lovely condition, apart from the coloration, you can see it's gone very beige. Uh, you can see, because it's an octopus, it has eight arms. Uh, people often ask the difference between an arm and a tentacle, and there's lots of internal ones, of course, but one of the main ones is that arms have suckers along the entire length, whereas tentacles only have uh, suckers at the very end of a tentacle club. But being an octopus, this doesn't have any uh, tentacles, just eight arms. And you can see an eye on either side. And cephalopod, uh, as a word, actually means head foot because the head, you can see in the middle here, is attached to the feet in, in sort of what it uses for moving around, the arms, uh, you can see on the bottom here. And I guess it's very strange kind of body plan because the head is in the middle and the, the organs, the body is at the top. So I guess it's a bit like us having our head uh, just below our stomach before our legs. So all the organs, are housed in here. So the, the two gills, um, three hearts, because octopus actually have three hearts, not one like us. They have one systemic and two brachial. Uh, so each gill has its own uh, heart. Uh, so And you can see here, this is where the mouth would be. So this has actually been dissected. So the mouth would sit in the center there. And squid and octopus and their relatives have a beak uh, structure. It looks a bit like a parrot's beak, actually, uh, made of chitin. And that sits in there, so that's how they feed, although this one, as you can see, has been dissected uh, right open. But I said it's lovely to, to kind of understand that this specimen was collected by Darwin in Cape Verde and is now in the collections for more people to study. So like all the specimens here at the Natural History Museum, it's very much a working collection and we use it to learn more about the natural world. Now, I mentioned earlier that it's beige and one of the ways we preserve animals in spirit, so generally using alcohol, uh, is amazing. And like I said, it, it keeps the organs intact, keeps the, the animal intact. You also get things like the stomach contents, any waste products that might have the poop, um, also diseases and parasites. It's an amazing way of preserving specimens, but it really doesn't hold the color. So a lot of the organisms that we hold here go sort of beige brown color after a long time. And incidentally, that's one reason why uh, lots of the early voyages uh, took artists and painters with them to capture the beautiful colours uh, of these animals before the coloration uh, started to fade. And as you said, uh, Darwin was absolutely obsessed with this animal. I, I'm not sure if he'd ever seen a live octopus, but it certainly uh, very much fascinated him. Uh, he and he watched it playing in the in the rock pools, and he, and he did keep it uh, alive uh, for a few days, I believe, uh, in a in a bucket of water uh, in order to study it uh, further. Uh, one interesting fact is that uh, he writes in his diaries that this uh, common octopus uh, showed bioluminescence. So it actually uh, lit up in the dark, like lots of 
deep sea animals do. You know, we think of, you know, things like anglerfish lighting up and, and lots of animals do glow in the dark. But unfortunately, the common octopus does not have any bioluminescent organs. So what we think was happening was that Darwin had, had uh, picked up the octopus, put it in a bucket of seawater, and probably there were other bioluminescent microorganisms in the water. Um, uh, and as the octopus was moving around the bucket, it was stimulating these to flash rather than the octopus itself. Um, but yes, yeah, such an amazing specimen. And to think that, you know, collected by Darwin in 1831 and now in my collections, it's a, it's a real honor to look after this. All right, so a huge shout out to John from the Museum of Natural History in London. Quite amazing to be able to see a specimen collected in 1831 by Charles Darwin while he was in Cape Verde. So specimens are all fine and great, and it's an amazing piece of history, but I think we should now go to the National Marine Aquarium uh, in Plymouth in the United Kingdom, where we have the amazing Becca standing by, uh, and we're going to take a little visit and maybe see the octopus in a little bit of a different light here. Just introducing Barbara here. Barbara is our common octopus. She's very, very new to the aquarium. She's only been here for about a month. She's getting settled in. She's getting comfortable in her tank. And she is really, really being someone that everyone is very excited to come and see here. If we look in the tank, you can see that she's really showing off her amazing eight okay. arms. Like she's balls, stretching out with yeah. them. She's playing and she's using those strong suckers to hold on, but also experience the world around yeah, her. She can go. actually taste using those suckers on her arms, which is very, very helpful to be able to really get an understanding of what's happening in the water around her. But if I think about being able to taste with my feet and my arms and thinking about tasting everything I touch and everything I walk on, I'm not sure that I'd enjoy that very much. But as well as her amazing eight arms, Barbara also has three hearts. She's got two hearts, one on each side of her gills, and they help pump oxygenated blood to her systemic heart, which is in the center of her body there. And that's really, really important, as I said, for those nice, strong arms that she has got there. We heard earlier that she's also got a beak, and that beak is actually the only hard part in her body. She doesn't have any bones whatsoever, which means she can be really, really squishy. And when she wants to, she can squeeze it to the smallest spaces. If a space is bigger than her beak, which for an octopus of her size is probably about the size of a 20p piece, then she can get through. So octopuses are excellent at hiding and squeezing through teeny tiny spaces. Another thing that they're absolutely brilliant at is camouflage. All over an octopus's body are something called chromatophores. And chromatophores are pigment-filled cells that can expand and contract, bringing that pigment to the surface or away again to change color. And they can even change their texture as well. And this is really useful for lots and lots of different reasons. It helps them hide from predators. They don't want to get eaten. And a lot of people do think they're a tasty snack. So they're able to hide from predators by changing color and camouflaging into their habitat. They can also use this camouflage to hide up on their, from their prey. So octopuses are what we call ambush predators which means when it's time for them to hunt, they'll get nice and settled in a little crook or a nook of a, maybe a rock pool, and they'll change color so that they're camouflaged in beautifully. And then they'll wait, and they'll be very still and very quiet. And then when the crab is least expecting it, they'll attack, and the poor crab won't even have seen them coming. So camouflage is really important for it's hunting, it's really important for staying safe. But another thing that octopuses can use their camouflage skills for, their colour changing ability, is to express their emotions. So this is what colour we normally see, Barbara. This is her chilled, happy colours. She's a little bit of a lighter brown. If she's really happy, especially yeah. after she's just eaten, she's nice and full, she's nice and content, she'll go, almost a white colour, really, really a good girl. But well if done. she's hungry, 
and even worse, if she's hangry and she's waiting for her food, then she will go a much darker colour. It'll go really, really deep red and that'll be her showing the biologist that she is ready for dinner and she is getting hungry. So those camouflaging skills are really, really important for her to be able to express emotions, which is something that not a lot of other animals can do. Now, you might be wondering what on earth is happening in this tank? There's a ball there, there's a toy stuck to the window. And if you want to follow me, we're gonna go behind the scenes and we're gonna talk to Emily, who is the biologist attached to those hands. So come with me and let's find out what it is that she's doing. So this is top secret VIP back of house areas. And if you can follow me up here, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Emily. Emily, can you say hello to everyone? Hi everyone. And can you tell us what on earth you're doing in here with all these toys and with Barbara? So because Barbara is obviously a very clever octopus, octopus have about the intelligence of about a four year old. So because she's in our tanks, we like to make sure that she's entertained every day. We give her lots of toys, lots of enrichment. So as you can see, she had a little spinny ball. If you look behind Becky over here, she's got boxes and boxes of toys. So many toys. Over here, she's got even more toys. So she's got a variety. We make sure that she doesn't get the same thing, the same interaction every day. Just to give her a really full, very enriched life because she is a very, very clever octopus. That's amazing. So you said she was about as clever as a four-year-old child. Yes. That's amazing. So if anyone's watching who maybe has any little brothers or sisters, there is a chance that Barbara the octopus is as smart as them. Is that right? Yeah. And as you know, with uh, your little brothers and sisters, they are just as, she's just as much trouble as them <laughs> as well. So. Excellent. So she's got lots of toys to play with. And do you feed her any differently because of this intelligence? Yes, yeah, so we make sure that she gets a really big variety of everything. Um, so she will often eat prawns. Uh, she's not a massive fan of mussels, we found out recently. Fair enough. Um, crabs, lots of things like that. So we make sure that she gets a really, really varied diet. And also um, we feed her so she's got to figure out how to get her food out. So if you look underneath there, we will often end up giving her things like the pipes, putting her food into the pipe. So she's got to work out how to get her food out of the pipe from the end of it, um, just to make sure that she's really engaging her brain because she's oh. a very, very smart little So octopus. it makes it a little bit more challenging, which I imagine makes it a little bit more interesting for her as well. Oh yeah, and it makes it more interesting for us as well. So. Yeah, I'd imagine that's fairly important too. <laughs> so we know that you look after octopuses a little bit differently than some of the other animals because of that intelligence. Yeah. And we're here at the Ocean Conservation Trust because we want to conserve the animals, not just yeah. here in our aquarium, but out in the ocean. So are there any problems that octopuses are facing, any threats? There are a few threats that octopus are facing, not necessarily to the octopus themselves, but ocean acidification is one of them. Um, because obviously, like I mentioned before, we are feeding her crabs, um, things like that. And obviously crabs have uh, calcium in their shells. And if the ocean's becoming more acidic, the uh, shells of the crabs are gonna start degrading, um, probably seeing less crabs, which are gonna therefore affect the octopus, which are further up the food chain. Yeah, so. absolutely. So the ocean acidification is affecting the octopus's food source. Yeah. And I'd imagine their home as well, because octopuses like to live on coral reefs, right? Oh yeah, 100%. So. Mm -hmm. The less coral cover that we're seeing, the less food sources that they're going to have, this is going to eventually impact a very, very beautiful creature. So. Okay. So we had a little look at ocean acidification a couple of weeks ago on the world's most exciting classroom. And we've actually got another experiment that we'd like to do just to see what actually happens when, or how, I should say, ocean acidification actually happens. Because ocean acidification is one of the effects of climate change. And climate change is a pretty big subject. It can be a little bit confusing and there's lots to it. So let's break it down a little bit for anyone maybe who is still a bit confused or who wasn't able to see that session a couple of weeks ago. So climate change is happening amongst other things because of too much of one particular gas in the air. This gas is called carbon dioxide. 
And this gas is being released into the atmosphere because we are burning fossil fuels. These are things like coal and oil and natural gases that have been underground for millions and millions of years. So we're digging them up and we're burning them. And the reason that we're burning them is to create energy. So we burn them so that we can drive our cars and fly our planes and our buses and our trucks. It also provides us electricity for our houses so we can watch TV and have the lights on, which is pretty useful. Things like plastic are also made by burning fossil fuels. So all these different things that humans are doing is creating carbon dioxide, which is going into the atmosphere. And then it's getting absorbed into our oceans. And once it's in there, it's causing a few problems. We're gonna head front of house. Emily, I'm gonna ask you to come with me because you're yes. gonna play a part in this. And we're gonna see what actually happens when that carbon dioxide enters the water. So we're gonna pop back out. And just to make sure that we are really understanding what's happening, we need to know a little bit about something called the pH scale. Now the pH scale, if you haven't heard of it before, is a way that we can tell whether a liquid is acidic or alkaline. And if you have a look on the wall here, the pH scale goes from zero, and that's a liquid that is very acidic, like vinegar. And it goes all the way through neutral to alkaline, which is the opposite of acidic. Now, these different states are represented by a colour. And if you take something called universal indicator and you add it to some water or any liquid really, it will tell you where on the pH scale your liquid is sitting. And if we were to think about our oceans, then they're sitting at about 8.1. They're about here on the pH scale, which is great. It's neutral. We're happy with that. But what happens to our ocean when carbon dioxide is added. What happens to the levels? We're gonna do a little experiment now to find out. I've got a few friends who are gonna help me along and these friends are all very invested on the health of the ocean. And they are going to add carbon dioxide to their beakers to see what happens and how it changes. So I want everyone to say a big hello and a big welcome to my friend, Myrtle the turtle. Everyone give Myrtle the turtle a wave. Come on in, Myrtle, come on in. Grab yourself a beaker of ocean. Excellent. I also want everyone to say a big hello and a big welcome to my friend. It's Coral the mermaid. Hi, Coral, thanks for joining us there. And last but most certainly not least, this is an episode all about octopuses. So can everyone say hello and welcome to Emily the octopus. Come on in, come on in. Amazing. You're going to take that for me. Lovely arm wave there. Myrtle, come on in, come on in. Our gang here have got 30 seconds. They've got 30 seconds to blow as much carbon dioxide into their beakers as possible. And we will see who can change the pH level the most. Before they start, have a quick think. Have a little think, turn to your neighbour and think, which way is it going to go? Is it going to get more acidic? Is it going to get more alkaline? Is it just going to stay exactly the same? I don't know. We're going to find out. These guys are going to do a competition. Who do you think is going to be able to change the carbon the most? I'm not sure. Let's cheer on the, the mermaid, the animal, whoever we think is going to change it the most. They're going to have 30 seconds. Can you help me count them down in five, in four, in three, two, one, go! Add that carbon, guys! Blow, 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 blow! How can they change their water? Is anything happening? Is it getting more acidic? Is it getting more alkaline? They've got 10 seconds left. Blow, 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 blow. I'm definitely seeing some changes here. The water is changing. The actual chemistry of the water is changing. And we've got five seconds left. Four, three, two, one. Everybody stop. Oh my goodness. Gang, hold out your beakers of ocean. What has happened? Well, they started off green. They started off over here at seven and they have not become more alkaline. They have gone all the way over. I think, I think corals has changed the most. It has come to number two. 
it has got significantly more acidic. So I think first things first, we need a round of applause for Coral. Excellent job, excellent job. And doesn't that just go to show the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere when it gets absorbed into the ocean becomes more acidic. Now, that's the end of our experiment there. We are going to send all the information out to you so you can do this experiment at home or in your classrooms. And once you've done it, I want you to have a little chat. I want you to have a little bit of a think about what you can do as an individual, as a class, maybe as a school, to try and reduce the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere. We probably don't all own factories, so that might not be something that we can control. But I reckon there would be some things that we could all do that would help our ocean be healthier and happier and safer. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what ideas you all come up with. Now, just before I go today, there's one more thing that I want to talk to you about. If you have had fun meeting Barbara and meeting all of my friends here and doing some brilliant science experiments, then do not fear, do not worry, because there is more fun to be had. Here at the Ocean Conservation Trust, based in the National Marine Aquarium, we're hosting a virtual STEM Fest activity. It's happening in October. All of the details in our website and anyone can join from anywhere in the world absolutely for free. So if you want to have more fun, have a look on our website and sign up for Virtual STEM Fest 2023. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks, Joe. See you soon. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, what an experiment. Thanks to our Coral Reef crew for being there uh, with us as well. Very cool. We're now going to play a quick round of Kahoot and see what we learned about the octopus today. Um, let me load up that onto the screen. So remember, with our Kahoot, we do have a prize uh, for the top spot. So there's going to be four questions uh, in today's Kahoot. Uh, the quicker you can get your right answer in, the more points you are going to get. So let's get that Kahoot front and center. There we go. So you need to go to Kahoot.it. Kahoot.it is the website. It's going to ask you for a PIN number, 933 428 is your pin number for today. If you have one-to-one -one technology at your seat, uh, you can sign in there. If not, no big deal. Your teacher can put up at the front of the room and you can shout out your answers to him or her. If you have something like a tablet or a mobile device, you can scan this QR code. It will bring you right in. So we can see we have students in classrooms joining. We've got the zany unicorn, the super tiger, the Great Falcon, lots of great animal names coming in here. There are four questions today. Do multiple choice, two true and false. You have 20 seconds to get your answer in. If it's right, you're getting points. If it's right and you do it really fast, you get even more points. If it's wrong, doesn't matter how fast you put in that wrong answer, there will be no points for you. So I can see that we still have lots of students, lots of classrooms joining. So we'll give it another couple more seconds. Uh, to get everything nice and loaded up. Uh, and then we will go ahead and we will do our Kahoot together. While the Kahoot is loading, I wanna play a special video here for the STEM Fest that Becca mentioned. We're excited for the STEM Fest. I think all of your classrooms should get excited as well. So let's take a look at this little video clip as the Kahoot continues to load. It's that time of year. It is our annual school STEM Fest. And this year, for the first year ever, we're going virtual. This year's Virtual STEM Fest is inspired by Charles Darwin himself. It is absolutely full of national curriculum links and best of all, it's completely free. Bookings are open, so reserve your spot now. So I think we cannot wait any longer. We've got to get this Kahoot going. So here we go, I am hitting start. You're gonna be counted in with three seconds and then we're gonna find out who comes out on top. On our podium today, our top three student contestants. So how many hearts does an octopus have? Is it one, two, three, or four? Those answers are flying in. Is it one, two, three, or four hearts that an octopus has? You've got about five seconds to get that answer in. And then we are moving on to our next question. All right, good job crew. Most students went with three. We learned there's kind of the one main heart uh, and two other ones as well in that body. 
The Great Falcon is in first place, and we will jump to our next question. A true and false. A tentacle has suckers all the way along its length. Is that true or is that false? That a tentacle has suckers all the way along its length. Is that true or is that false? This is a bit of a tricky one. All right. Well, a huge shout out to those who picked false because that is absolutely correct. Remember, an octopus has an arm and the tentacles go all the way, or sorry, the suckers go all the way along, but a tentacle just has the suckers on the end of the tentacle. So let's jump to another question here. The dandy elephant has taken that top spot. Our next question is a true and false. Octopus can taste with their arms. Is that true or is that false? True or false? Octopus can taste with their arms. All right, there we go, crew. We are back on track. That is absolutely true. Uh, the eight arms uh, of an octopus are absolutely amazing. The dandy elephant is holding on. Let's see if they can keep that spot for one more question. This is a multi-select. So pick as many of these answers that work. How does an octopus use camouflage? Does it communicate emotions? Does it hide from predators? Does it glow in the dark? Or does it sneak up on prey? So you have to pick as many of these answers as you think or as you learned from Becca today. All right, that was our first multi-select question. I know that was probably new to a lot of students, um, but we had a lot of good answers there. They can communicate their emotions, they hide from predators, they sneak up on prey. So clicking all three of those would have got you the most points uh, for that question. Let's take a look at the podium. In third place, we've got the eager hen. In second place, we have the dandy elephant, which means we have a new leader here holding down that first spot. And that is the Wonder Koala. Very, very cool. All right, Wonder Koala, if you are out there, you need to send me an email. I'm gonna share that link with you right here uh, on the screen. You need to send me an email to ebtsoyp uh, at gmail.com. ebtsoyp at gmail.com. Uh, I'm gonna have to make a quick new banner here because our banner seems to have disappeared. So. E-B-T-S-O-Y-P at gmail.com. So send me an email to here uh, and we will make sure that you are all set up with your prize for your classroom. All right, we are moving right along. Uh, I am going to bring in uh, the Ocean Conservation Trust again for another couple minutes because we're going to do a couple quick octopus questions before we meet Alberto and Biosphera in Cape Verde. So Emily and Becca, how are we doing? Have we recovered from our experiment? Yeah, I think so. We've got a little announcement happening now. So sorry if you can hear that as well. But yeah, I think all of our coral creatures have recovered and got their breath back. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> all right. Well, it's a working aquarium, so we're not surprised at all that it's busy. Thank you so much for being out there for us today. Let's take a couple octopus questions, and then we're going to meet our team in Cape Verde. So I'm gonna to go to Missouri first. Miss Dylan's class is hanging out with us. How are you doing today? Hey, we're doing really good. Excellent. Let's get an octopus question on deck. So okay. I have a question for you. Because like they're so smart, do you think that we could like use their like brains to understand ours? Well, I don't know whether you've seen, but obviously a few years ago they actually used um, an octopus to predict the World Cup, and so I think. Yeah, probably octopuses are extremely intelligent creatures. So I don't see why we couldn't use them to understand human intelligence and also gain a better understanding of intelligence in general. Um, I think they're really, really smart creatures and quite underestimated. Yeah, and we're, all, we're still learning new we're things. We're still learning new things. Um, yeah, she blows my mind every day when I come <laughs> in. She's got her own little personality personality own little character um is very human like to be honest with you um just communicate slightly differently to what we do yeah 
Thank you. All right, great question. Uh, let's see here. We have a virtual crew. Miss Kirk's crew is hanging out with us. Let's see if they have a virtual question for us. How you doing, Miss Kirk? I'm great. How you doing? Thank you for having us. Uh, yeah, we had a couple of questions. What do octopuses look when they're born? What are their size and uh, how big can they get? Good question. That is a good question. Um, basically, baby octopus look like little mini versions um, and they just literally just grow up. So they don't look any different to what she does now. Just much, much smaller. Um, she... They do get a little bit bigger. Um, it obviously depends on the species of octopus as well. What we've got is a common octopus. Um, she might get to about, what would you say? I mean, yeah. They're very squidgy, so it's yeah. really difficult to measure. Them. So the only solid part of their body is obviously their beak. So um, her beak will probably get to a couple of inches, maybe. Um, but yeah, like I said, it depends on the size of the octopus. I think one that we worked with, um, her name was Spaghetti. She, her head was probably about this big when um, we had her. Um, so it just, it, it does vary. Like like people, it just depends on their genetics and stuff like that and how big they'll get. And there's different species, right? Yeah, different species. So um, what did we have? The Pacific octopus. Yes. Um, that big. She got really big. So, yeah, it just depends on the species and also just depends on the individual as well. All right. Excellent. Spaghetti. That is such a good name for an octopus. Very, very cool. All right. Well, we are going to shift gears now. Back in Emily, thank you so much for being with us. We're going to get a PDF up on the website so students can try that experiment in their classroom. And then we'll have a question or two as the challenge uh, for the students, including what can they do uh, to help reduce that impact. Uh, very exciting stuff. Barbara is absolutely amazing. So thank you for taking us uh, backstage to the top secret inner workings of the aquarium today. Very, very cool. Thank you for having me. Thank bye. you. Bye. All right. We'll see you soon. So as I mentioned, we have Darwin 200 leaders working away in Cape Verde right now. We are going to connect with Alberto from Biosphere, who do absolutely incredible work. And then we also have a Darwin leader, looks like, joining her. And her name is Allie, and she's been working on a sea turtle project this week. Now, before I bring them in live, I want to share a really cool clip here that's going to highlight some of the biodiversity you can find on Cape Verde. Absolutely amazing. I'm so jealous of our leaders this week. Let's bring in our guests from Cape Verde. We have Alberto joining us, Conservation Department Coordinator, and we have Ali joining us, who is one of our Darwin 200 leaders. How are you doing today? Hello, Joe. Hello, everybody. We're doing great. What about you? Oh, we are so good. I hope you got to catch a little bit of the octopus action. It was so great to meet Barbara yeah. today. Um, and this has just been a jam-packed, world's most exciting classroom. So, Alberto, I want you to start. Tell us a little bit about your organization and some of the work you do. Great. So uh, I'm working in, in Biosfera, which is a local NGO from here, from Cabo Verde. Um, um, we focus our work basically in the conservation protection and conservation of the marine and coastal species. As you can see in the video, uh, Biosfera is Biosfera. Cabo Verde is a very dry country, so the richness of the biodiversity focuses more on the sea. All right, excellent. And uh, Emily, I know, or sorry, uh, Ali, I know you spent some time in the sea this week. What have you been up to? Yeah, so I've been taking pictures of the turtles to make 
the first database with Biosphera. I've also seen the hatcheries, they dig them up and they do tests to see how well they're working. And I've also had the privilege of seeing them do some DNA samples on the turtles. Yeah, it's been really fun. All right. And I have a few video clips here, uh, Ali. It looks like you had quite the close encounters. I want to share this first one here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It looks like a little turtle headbutt there. What was it like to be in the water with them? It looked absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it, it was incredible. I've never snorkeled with turtles before, so seeing them was beautiful. And there were so many just flying over, flying, swimming over each other. Yeah, it was it was beautiful. All right. I have one more clip here. You mentioned the hatchery. So I know you got to get kind of a little hands-on. Can you tell us a little bit about this? I'll drop the volume down a bit so you can talk a little bit about what you were up to. Okay. Yeah, so they dig up the nests two days after they've hatched. And uh, if they have any surviving hatchlings, we release them into the ocean. And the one we dug up the other day, there was just one. And uh, yeah, all the local community was there and they watched. It was, it was really nice. All right, Alberto, I see you there in that video as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about the loggerhead turtles and uh, about project and about that project in general? Sure. So here in Cabo Verde, we have five different species of turtles, uh, but just a few of them come out of the water for nesting. In this case, 99.9% uh, of the nesting activities that we have come from loggerhead, which is the most common turtle around the world. Uh, Cabo Verde is the third largest population of, of, uh, lo uh, of loggerhead in the world. Uh, depends on the year because of the quality of the turtle change from year to year. So, for example, in 2021, we have an amazing uh, season. Um, that year, uh, Cabo Verde became in the, f most lar in the largest um, uh, place in the world for loggerhead turtle. Um, in this case, we are in the northwest side of the country. We get less nests than in other islands, like for example in Boavista and Sal, which are closer to the continent. They get probably 60% of the nests of the country. But even so, we have a, an important population here in San Vicente, which is the island where Biosphere is, is based. Um, uh, this year, we start a new activity, which is the hatchery, which has different purposes, different uh, objectives. The first one is the protection of the nest. Uh, that's our priority. Uh, why are we protecting the nest? Because we have plenty of stray dogs. Uh, unfortunately, here in San Vicente, and um, they learn how to find the nest, how to eat the eggs, and how to eat the hatchlings. So that's the first reason. Also, we have plenty of communities with light pollution. So I don't know if you guys know, but the hatchlings, they follow the light. So whenever they hatch, if they have uh, artificial light behind them, they are going to go to the community instead of going to the sea. So as I said, that's our priority. But it's not the only reason why we built a hatchery. Uh, it's also like a, a place for uh, for communication, for like environmental awareness. It's also a place for some uh, scientific studies. And it's also a place for creating some ecotourist activities for the community. So we are trying to kind of like improve the state of the community as well. So as you can see, it's a very cool activity that it has several purposes, several objectives. All right. Excellent. Well, it is amazing conservation work. I highly suggest uh, that those who are tuning in dig a little deeper and check out some of the work that you, Alberto, and your team are doing. Uh, and Ali, it looks like you have had just an absolute blast. We can't wait to see uh, your video projects highlighting the conservation work uh, and things that could be done in the future. So uh, I imagine the next few days are going to be pretty busy for you, Ali. A lot of editing. Yeah. My camera operator is very busy editing the documentary yet. Excellent. All right. Well, we have some time. So I'm going to bring in a few classrooms and let's see if they have some sea turtle questions for us. Uh, so we haven't visited Mrs. Cross's crew yet. There are some grade six students. So let's see if I can get them in. Miss Cross, if you're there and you want to unmute, we'd love a, a sea turtle question if you guys have one. I'm so sorry. We just had our morning announcement. So we sort of missed a bit of that. Does anybody have a sea turtle question really quick? Yeah, Ibrahim? Oh, they're wondering how come the turtle shells are so hard and what are they made of? And Oof, that, that was a tricky one. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that question at all. <laughs> so, uh, well, I couldn't tell you right now, to be honest. Uh, maybe we can do a quick Google. 
uh, we can Google it and we can check the information. I cannot tell you right now, sorry. And I can tell you more about conservation, biology, ecology, more than the anatomy or, or yeah, sorry. That's okay. We're going to assign that as a homework question for our class. Yeah, exactly. in, uh, is to find out what that material is made of. Uh, and what I can say, just touching on it a little bit, is just that sea turtles are pretty cool and, and unique from our land turtles in that they can't pull themselves inside of their shell like our land turtles can uh, for protection. So we have uh, another virtual class who's hanging out with us today. Uh, we haven't brought them in yet for a question. Looks like we've got, is that Mr. Roy hanging out backstage there? Excellent. Does your crew have a sea turtle question for us? Oh, unfortunately. Oh, I oh. will ask them just one moment. Please. Perfect. Those who are tuning in live, I can see that we have groups now saying hi uh, in places like Brazil, in the Netherlands. If you have any sea turtle questions, don't be shy. That's why the chat is there. Uh, don't be afraid to put in a couple questions for us. While we wait to grab a question from our crew with Mr. Roy, let's see if our Missouri crew has a question for us. One of our kids off. All right. Kendall and Macy have a duo here. Who first? Me or Kendall? You first, Macy. Me? Yeah. Oh, how many hatchlings survive? And how are the native people involved with um, biofare to help with conservation? And that's one of the questions. How many eggs do they get? Or how many hatchlings and eggs? Okay, so uh, the question about the eggs, this species, the careta careta, it lays like an average of 80 eggs. Uh, per clutch, but they, they can lay like up to seven times per season. So sometimes they lay like one clutch, another time two clutch, but they can go till seven clutches. Okay. Um, I already found some turtles that they lay over a over hundred eggs, but as I said, the average is 80 eggs for this species. Then there are other species like Hawksbill, it can reach 200 eggs per, per clutch. Yeah. All right. How is the local community involved? Oh, yeah, we are actually counting quite a lot with the local community. That's really important for us. One of the main threats that we have here in Cabo Verde is poaching. So people uh, kill the turtles because of the meat and also because of the eggs. So actually turning around the situation and using the people from the community, the ex-poachers, we are using them to do conservation on the beach. So we are changing the mindset of the communities. But like for us, it's essential for all the kind of conservation work that we do, always come with the community, always involving them in every single action that we develop. Okay. All right. Those were yeah. two amazing questions. Thank you so much to our crew uh, in Missouri. Uh, Mr. Roy, do you have a question on deck for us from your crew? We certainly do. Yes. Excellent. The question that was asked is, what is the size of the turtles that you have observed? And what are the size of the eggs that you've seen as well? Okay, so in this case, thank you for the question. In this case, we have, um, we will focus in two different species, okay? Ali was working with a green turtle, a green turtle species that in this case is not a nesting area for it, it's a feeding area, okay? So we don't have adult turtles. We have juveniles and we have sub-adults. Uh, green turtles, normally they are a bit bigger than careta careta, but in this case, because they, are, they still didn't reach the adulthood, they are more or less the same size. We are talking... We, we found turtles from, I don't know, like 30 centimeters till probably 80, 90. We are talking about the length of the carapace. This is how we measure a turtle, right? And then careta careta, the average is something between 70 and 80. It can reach like 90 something as well, depends on the age, but I would say something between 70 and 80. Then the, the size of the eggs, I couldn't tell you right now, but something like that. <laughs> it's like a ping pong ball. It's like the size of a ping pong ball. Something like that, but it's not hard. That's the difference with, for example, uh, bird eggs, okay? This is a soft egg. It's basically because when it's releasing the egg from the cloaca, it still has like 50 centimeters to fall. So whenever the egg hits the ground, it cannot break, right? So that's the reason because it's, it's uh, soft. Yeah. All right, very cool, great questions. Mrs. Kirk, do you wanna sneak one in before we wrap up with our experiment and curiosity of the week? Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, how um, we have Aya and Alice both asking questions here. How big can these sea turtles get and um, how long uh, can they live for? 
Okay, so that's going to depend on the on the species again. We have seven different species of marine turtle around the world, and the biggest one is the leatherback. So leatherback in the past used to reach between three, four meters on land, and we are talking just about the carapace. Also, in this case, uh, leatherback they don't have a, they have a fake carapace. They don't have a hard one. They have a leather one, right? But they can reach between three, four, even five meters in length. Then the smallest one, which is the Cambrilli, uh, that it nests in the Gulf of Mexico, it's something between 30, 40, maximum 50 centimeters. Yeah. What was the second question? You asked about the length and also about the age. Okay, the age is something like very, very, everybody, very, like everybody has the curiosity about the age of the turtle because there is this legend that they live over 100 years. It's hard to say. You need to make, you need to take some DNA samples and analyze everything, right? But it's true that they can live over 100 years, especially in the past. Nowadays they have several threats. Uh, some of them are natural, but some of them are anthropogenic, right? So uh, because of that, nowadays they are not living that long, but they can they can go over 100 years. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for those amazing questions, classrooms. Uh, as per usual, you always never fail to impress when it comes time for the questions. I want to put up the website. If you want to check out more of uh, about Fair's work, uh, Alberto, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for the conservation work you're doing. And Ali, so I have, have fun with your, your, your last few days in Cape Verde. It looks like you've been having a blast. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully no more turtle attacks. Hopefully not. <laughs> All right. Okay, okay. Thank you, guys. Keep having fun. Thank you. Much. All right. So to wrap up today, we're going to bring in Stuart McPherson shortly. He is the expedition leader. He's in Cape Verde as well. But I want to share the results uh, from our previous week's experiment. And then Stu will talk a little bit about uh, the winner. So here we go. Let us share that video. Uh, and then we'll bring Stuart uh, in live with us. So here we go. Welcome back. Two weeks ago, I posed the question to you of why the Darwin finches have different shaped beaks and what evolutionary processes have driven the difference in beak shape. Well, let's find out the answer. Imagine you're a bird. Obviously, you don't have hands to eat your food with. So how would you eat different seeds and nuts and insects than the diet of most of the Darwin finches? Well, some of the islands of the Galapagos have large nuts this is quite difficult to break open, so you'd need something powerful to crack the nut, like a nutcracker. Let's have a look. Oh, <laughs> yep, that breaks apart pretty easily with a nutcracker, but I couldn't do that with my hands. So clearly, you'd need a very powerful beak to open big nuts, like that walnut. But what about smaller nuts? Look at these ones here. A nutcracker is no good for these tiny little nuts. It can't even pick them up. And even if it can, it would just squish them. So that's clearly not going to help. But a smaller pair of tweezers is perfect for the job. Look, with a smaller tweezer-like beak, you could easily pick up a smaller nut like that. A lot of the Darwin finches also eat squishy invertebrates, bugs. Neither the nutcracker nor the sharp tweezers would work so well on bugs because they'd just burst or get squished. But a sharp piercing beak would be just right for stabbing them to pick them up and eat them. In the instruction PDF, there were three examples of different species of Darwin finches, each illustrated to show their beak shape. Which species do you think relates to each of these three examples? Well, let's find out. The large ground finch has a really powerful beak and this is perfect for breaking open large nuts and hard seeds. The small ground finch has a smaller beak, similar to the tweezers, and this is perfect for breaking open and picking up smaller nuts and seeds. The sharp-beaked ground finch has a much narrower, sharper beak, as its name suggests, and this is perfect for picking up those little invertebrates and squishy bugs. Did you guess correctly? Let's find out who the winners are of the three 50 pound Amazon vouchers. All right, let's bring Stuart in with us right now. Hey, Stu, how are you doing today? Hello, it's lovely to speak to you. I'm calling from Kit Verde, 
rather than the Darwin studio uh, today. So it's lovely to speak to you from, from Cape Verde. Yeah, absolutely amazing. This has been a jam-packed world's most exciting classroom. And we're excited to hear the, the winners this week. Absolutely. So we had lots of entries this week. Um, the, we had lots of them. It was actually very hard to, uh, to, to select between the top winners. The first pl place, though, went to Louis from King's College School in Cambridge. If there's any chance you could bring Louis's entry up, um, Joe, on the screen, it's in the, the folder, drop it folder. Sure. Yeah, let's talk about Louis's entry. I'll see if I can get it up behind the scenes. Okay. Perfect. So as, as you might have uh, remember from the, the competition PDF, there were three questions. The first was, how did the Darwin Finches reach the Galapagos Islands? And we thought Louis's answer, we had about, about 50 entries, we thought Louis was the best. He said, I think at first the Galapagos Finches would have looked the same, but their beaks would have changed sh shape depending upon their available food. Then they reached the island and diversified. So Louis was absolutely right in that answer. So many congratulations, Louis. He then said um, for the second question, which is um, why do the beaks have different shapes? Uh, why do the finches have different shaped beaks? He answered exactly perfectly, as you saw in that explanation video. It's the shape of the food that he ate that they ate. That's the main reason why the finches change. That's what Louis wrote. So um, one finch would need to have a strong beak to crush nuts. And that is exactly what you just saw. So well done, Louis. You got it absolutely right. And the last question concerned uh, what species of birds around the world have different beak shapes and why. And Louis picked out some examples of carnivorous birds like hawks, vultures and eagles. They have hooked, he wrote, they have hooked strong, sharp beaks so that they have to tear flesh. Louis, that is exactly right. So we're going to be in contact with you and send over your 50 pound uh, Amazon voucher prize. If you're in America or Canada or Brazil or any other country, you can still use the same uh, voucher, depending, it doesn't matter about your currency, you can use the same one. So well done, Louis, um, that was brilliant. Tobias, Jacob and Nathaniel won second place from Woodhouse Primary and Marcelo Fernandez from Spain won third place. So we'll be contacting all three of you, all, all, set, all, all three of you shortly to win your prizes. So really, really well done, guys. Please do submit your entries next week uh, for the next week, next week's prize. The um, the uh, the instruction PDFs and recordings of the experiments are all online, so you can easily access them if you want to. And we'll also do a mail out early next week as a reminder and with the links in. So well done, guys, for doing your competition entries, and congratulations to Louis, Tobias, Jacob, and Nathaniel and Marcelo for winning this week's prizes. All right, excellent. So as Stu mentioned, classroom at darwin200.com um, is the spot to send your entries. We are gonna upload the PDF and the video of the experiment from the aquarium today. Uh, we'll get that up there for you and you have two weeks to get those answers in. Um, and Stu, I think we need to do the curiosity of the week before we wrap up for today. Absolutely. So if you can kind of play the, the last week's answer. All right, let's take a look. Let's see what it is. This curiosity was this object here. This is a very difficult curiosity to guess. This is a shark caller. People across different parts of the Pacific use these to catch sharks. Fishermen go out on canoes, put it over the side of their boats and rattle it really loudly. And amazingly, the sound that the rattle makes actually mimics that of a fish in distress, which the sharks are attracted to, to eat. But of course, in this case, the sharks come up to the boats and the fishermen then catch the sharks and take them back to the island communities where they feed their families. So a bit of a tricky curiosity of the week this time. This is a shark caller from the Pacific. All right, Stuart, did anybody get it this week? Um, one person got it. We got quite a few uh, ideas that it might be some kind of necklace or even a harness for, for beasts of burden like oxen. But Mike Smith from Texas actually got, got it absolutely correct. He was the only one. So well done, Mike. You did amazing in identifying that, um, that shark caller. I think our last segment today is then this week's Curiosity. Curiosity, is this object here? Can you guess what this is? 
We've actually got an episode coming up specifically about this object. So hopefully you can work out what it is. I'll give you a clue. It grows on a plant. Good luck and submit your answers to info at darwin200.com. All right, All right, another challenging one. We'll put up uh, the option there for classrooms uh, to get those answers in by next week. So two weeks for the experiment, one week for the curiosity. Um, yeah, and we'll have you with us, uh, Stuart. It's going to be another exciting world's most exciting classroom next week. Absolutely. Really looking forward to it. And we, we thank everyone that submitted their answers and their photos of the different projects and experiments they've done. So thank you, everyone, for taking part. All right. Well, a huge shout out to everybody who joined from around the world today. I think there was at least four or five continents represented, uh, which is absolutely incredible. Thank you to the students for your amazing questions. A huge shout out to John at the National uh, History or Natural History Museum in London. A shout out to the crew at Ocean Conservation Trust uh, and the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth. And a shout out to you, Stu, you and the team and the Darwin leaders uh, and Alberto for joining us. I hope you guys are having an incredible time uh, in Cape Verde. Definitely. Thank you so much for joining everyone. All right. And we'll wrap up as always with a little shout out to our sponsors. Thank you so much to everybody who helps make uh, the Darwin 200 and the world's most exciting classroom possible.